Hello there everyone, and this is Shashu Das along with my colleague uh, Ashish Panigri and we are presenting a talk on or rather we are presenting a video on generalization which is a very beautiful concept in machine learning which is uh, the title of our course CS460 offered by the School of Computer Sciences of Nizer Bhuvneshwar and taught by Dr. Shubhankar Mishra of the School of Computer Sciences of Nizer. So this is a pretty abstract talk. We won't be going into any algorithms per se or anything. But before we dive into all that hardcore ML stuff, so to speak, we need to get an idea of uh, what the entire uh, what the entire motive behind it is. So moving on to the next slide. We have encountered something called artificial intelligence uh, multiple times in the past, well, the last few years or decades, and this brings to mind the question, what indeed is intelligence? Because uh, if we are trying to create something called artificial intelligence, we need to specify what intelligence means but to indicate that we have indeed achieved uh, well, AI. So, let's say we have a machine and it can do certain tasks and uh, we would say that we want to discern whether it's intelligent or not. So, what would be a good way of exactly saying that? So, the accepted convention for this is basically by comparing it to a human and humans are apparently very intelligent. So, the question is whether this machine is as good as a human being. Now, a natural question you might be asking is what happens if a machine turns out to be better than a human? In which case we call it uh, super intelligence. And uh, this hasn't been achieved yet. In fact, uh, I think or I haven't been aware of any instance in which a machine has been able to even approach human level intelligence. And uh, and when we talk about a human being, we mean an average human being, uh, not some kind of super genius or on the other end of the bell curve of IQ, so to speak. So, um, okay, so you might have heard the term machine learning. Uh, which uh, goes hand in hand with artificial intelligence and when can we say that a machine or an animal or a human being has learned something that is something that we need to define in order to uh, carry on with our discussion of machine learning so is it memorizing facts uh, as in we just get a training material uh, and we just wrote memorize anything that we have got does this indicate any kind of learning or if uh, or, or can we expect uh, that within the periphery of learning we can uh, <coughs> demand that uh, a machine learns from a particular material but it's able to answer questions from any other domain it encounters. So this is something that would solve a lot of problems for us. But is it too much to ask for? We'll look into that shortly. And then we have a sweet spot between memorization and the kind of omniscience that we talk about in case two, which is basically, uh, and case three basically is that we learn from certain material and then uh, based on what we have learned, we extrapolate a learning to answer questions from the same domain which are not explicitly given in the training material. Now, an illustrative example uh, is the following, uh, which takes the uh, above three mentioned cases, or rather the cases mentioned in the previous slide, and turns them uh, and discusses them in the context of a classroom. So the first one is memorization, in which uh, a student is taught subject A and given notes on it. And what the student basically does, it, does is 
um, basically wrote memorizes all the notes on the subject and in the exam the questions are directly from the notes so naturally the student aces the exam but again the question is uh, did the student indeed learn the subject or is it more of like uh, that student only being able to do stuff uh, that is restricted to those set of notes and then we have that second weird pathological case in which the student was taught subject A, but in the exam for some reason, uh, the student is given any other subject B, which is disjoint from A, but the student still managed to ace it. And it could be because of many, because of a plethora of reasons, but it still happens. We'll discuss this soon. And then we have the more conventional kind of learning that is done in classrooms in which a student is given the subject A, given notes on it, and then the exam is uh, basically, uh, well, the exam only consists of questions that are pertaining to the same domain, but it doesn't have the exact same questions as those given in notes. So what uh, a student that has just memorized might not be able to answer questions uh, of uh, this particular exam. And if a student aces it, then in a conventional sense, we say that uh, a student has learned something. And we can certify that a student is adept in a particular subject. Now, in memorization, as I said, uh, the student group memorizes and spits up answers to questions already encountered in notes. Uh, and, uh, to say that it's learning would be saying that um, uh, that part that happens to speak a few Arabic words is uh, halfway fluent in Arabic, if not uh, the entire way. And uh, what I'm trying to illustrate over here is that it doesn't tell us if the trainee can extrapolate what they learned. And uh, this just means that the machine or the student is not useful beyond what they are fed. So then we move on to the other extreme end of the spectrum in which we expect that the student is taught the subject A but the but in the exam they are given uh, questions on any other subject B and they are able to ace it. So this is possibly a God mode uh, in which uh, a student can do anything uh, even if it's not trained to do that. And this might seem very peculiar, this might seem the stuff of dreams and everything and at the current moment, uh, sorry to break it to you, it pretty much is. So the, uh, then again, in, uh, you might nitpick at this particular scenario and you just say that testing is done on any other subject but the one taught but the exam is only one so you can only say that that student is adept at subject B. But uh, uh, then again, uh, this apart from uh, from a god level intelligence or just luck, uh, this could be just that the student has actually gone through the previous subject. And uh, but we insist uh, in the context of this example that the student will be able to do this on any subject B, any subject B that is distinct from A. So we practically do have an omniscient level of being. Now, uh, this means that the student may or may not be proficient in what was actually taught, which is subject A, because it was they were never uh, really tested on questions based on subject A. So we don't even know that whether the student uh, actually went through the trouble of even memorizing what was in the notes for subject A. So then we have the conventional type of learning. So uh, what the student does is uh, they learn, they extrapolate to answer questions. And this happens to be the aim of current ML models. And this is not um, like the kind of omniscience that we were optimistically hoping for in the previous example. But what it can do, what the student can do, what the machine can do is work on uh, data or questions pertaining to the same domain. So the student learns uh, a set of concepts and it's able to or they are able to apply it uh, to questions that are in the same domain or are related to those uh, concepts. 
So this is called generalization as opposed to memorization in which uh, the student is only able to answer questions specific to the training material. But in this case, uh, the model uh, or the end product of the learning is a bit more general in the sense that the student is also able to answer stuff outside of those notes uh, in a more general manner with a great amount of accuracy, by the way. So that being said, there are various degrees of generalization. So we can ask how generalized is each of these cases? So memorization pretty much has zero generalization because all we do is we, uh, we only confirm that the student is able to answer questions that are specific to the training material. So there is no generalization to speak of, no extrapolation. Uh, in the pathological case, uh, the student is pretty much able to answer almost everything under the sun or beyond. So we call it uh, as being generalized, uh, as being completely generalized, as uh, having an infinite amount of generalization. And then we have learning which is somewhere in the middle and uh, what it does is it again is able to, of, uh, is capable of extrapolating what was learned and performs really well on questions that it hasn't encountered before on the same domain and it lies somewhere between memorization and the pathological case. And while I'm not aware of and I don't think that uh, there is indeed a formula or close from formula for calculating generalization, uh, this is a pretty good uh, illustration of looking at this entire learning framework as a spectrum of generalization. So why does generalization matter and is it something that is specific to machine learning itself? So we'll take some examples uh, involving in the natural world and one example from machine learning. Now, let's say you have a dog and you love cacti. So you have a bunch of them and you keep ordering them. And this dog has seen a cactus for the first time. So being curious, it might go over and think that it's a chew toy being as succulent as it is and you know, uh, do what dogs do to chew, uh, chew toys. But the sad part of the story is it gets hurt and all of that. So it learns not to go for that particular cactus. Now, let's say it sees another identical cactus, right? So since it has seen that, okay, something that looks like this, exactly like this, hurts me, it won't go for this. But, okay, if there is no generalization, if uh, the dog only memorizes that, okay, this plant in this particular pot with this particular appearance, with this number, with these number of, you know, branches, so to speak, uh, are harmful and I don't know about any other plant, then when it sees another cactus that you own, which uh, has a quite different appearance, then in the lack of generalization, it might prospectively end up going and doing the same to the new cactus and getting hurt in the process, which uh, is uh, something that you don't want happening in nature. And it indeed doesn't uh, and is an important part of learning in a natural setting. So generalization is important in the natural world. Now, let's say we have another talk. And let's say as a young puppy, it encountered a bird and that bird had an altercation with the dog. It kind of maybe attacked the dog or whatever. And as people often do, uh, this dog gets cynical about birds and says all birds are bad. Let's just hypothetically say that. And it never grows out of it. It just based on this particular isolated incident or maybe a few isolated incidents, it just draws the conclusion that all birds are bad, like as a strict rule. So whenever it comes across new birds, maybe uh, they're friendly, maybe they are not, uh, maybe they're not harmful at all, even if they're not friendly, it will get scared of these all the same, which we don't want. But it, it still happens because this dog overgeneralized, which is basically uh, the process of drawing very broad conclusions uh, given given that you are giving 
training material that is insufficient to reach that particular conclusion or you just stick to what, or what you have learned very fiercely. So it's safe to say that overgeneralization is an issue. Uh, now we will go on and discuss this in the context of machine learning as follows. So we use machine learning algorithms often nowadays for spam detection and let's say we have a bunch of males and uh, the good males, the males that should not be in the spam folder are labeled blue and those who, which are definitely spam are labeled red and they're plot due to some reason as dots in a, on a 2D plane as given. <clears throat> now you want something that can uh, differentiate between these two, let's call them clusters, so as to differentiate between what male is spam and which is not. So what about we go ahead and draw a line in between these two clusters. So we see that this performs really well and uh, it has a high amount of accuracy when it comes to uh, differentiating what is spam and not spam. But then again, you might get pedantic and say that, uh, that there's a good point on the bad end of the line and then there's a spam mail that got passed to filter. So you want 100% accuracy. And if you stay obstinate like that, uh, then again, perfectionism is an issue. And if you draw an extremely conforming boundary to classify these, then you might get something like this. And based on this particular training material, that is um, spam and non-spam email that is given to the uh, machine learning algorithm to learn uh, to, how to differentiate uh, good males from bad males, then in that case, you run the risk of actually getting a situation like this, that even if you get 100% accuracy on the training material, uh, let's say uh, another male pops up, but then again, because uh, it is particularly somewhere, it is on the bad side of this very squiggly line, it gets classified as spam. And you would say that uh, I trained this to have 100% accuracy, but this is clearly not the case. Right? Uh, if you have a point over here or a point over here, uh, if my pointer is visible, then you certainly do have a problem. And uh, that being said, this is kind of like uh, you are memorizing what you learned. And this is called overfitting. Because you too vehemently uh, fit your model to get 100% accuracy on the training set. So the end the end objective of machine learning is to not get perfect models but models that perform very accurately on uh, what we train them on and uh, what we test them on and now i shall be handing it over to ashish for some in-depth discussion on what this means for machine learning so over to you ashish thank you Shashwat. so i'll take it from here so my colleague, he explained, giving an example of spam detection, he explained about what overfitting really means and how it relates to the model learning it by rote or memorization. I'll be talking about the other part of the extreme, which is underfitting. So let's take the case of uh, fire predicting the efficiency of a car as a function of the distance traveled by it. Here we see that the orange squares they denote the training data set and we choose a linear model to sort of predict the behavior of this data set. Here clearly one can see that not all the points in the data set align with the blue line meaning that the linear model does not accurately depict the variation of the training data set. In this case, we say that the model underfits or does not predict the variation present in this training data set. What about the other extreme? So for overfitting, for the same training data set, we say that this sort of squiggly model that is chosen fits too tightly to the training data set. You may see that all the points 
a line on on the blue curve in this case we say that the model is overfitted clearly this overfitted model works too well for the training data set at hand but what about any other disjoint testing data set that one might use for predicting the efficiency in that case it's natural to think that this quigley model will fail miserably for any other disjoint training data uh, testing data set sorry so the only difference from the predictions context between underfitting and overfitting is that for overfitting it works extremely well for the training data set which it has been modeled for but fails really badly for a disjoint testing data set but in the case of underfitting it already fails for the training data set so it is only natural that it would also fail for testing data set not not natural really but from a generalized context i mean one might be lucky enough to get a testing data set which is linearly varying with this blue line so in that case one is it's really a matter of luck but from a general point of view the underfitted model would would not work for a disjoint testing data set okay but how does one really sort of qualify this underfitting or overfitting capacity of a model so here we will be talking about what one means by bias and variance so one typically talks about machine learning algorithms or models which have high bias low variance or low bias or high variance so we'll be talking about what one means when somebody uses that jargon so let's talk about what bias is so from a very textbook definition of bias from a english perspective it really means an attitude that always favors one way of feeling without considering other possibilities so let's say there are two parties parties a and b and i am an observer and my viewpoints align with the arguments presented by party b let's say and i do not listen to the arguments presented by party a so in that case it is i can say that i am biased my viewpoints are biased towards party b's what does one mean by this from uh, from the context of machine learning so we have the a similar model that we had shown in the case uh, in the, for the example of a car here we have the training data set depicted by blue circles and we are using a linear model let's say linear regression for example to fit this data in this case clearly one sees that the training data set is not really linear in nature but one still tries to fit a linear model to it so this is where bias comes in or rather one what one means by bias so it is this sort of con of a model or the inability for the model to accurately fit into or depict the the nature or the variation of the training data set at hand so in this case we say that this linear model has high bias or rather it is very much biased towards linearly separable data or data which has linear variation it is biased towards that and in this case, in this data set it clearly does not depict uh, the training data set to be linear now let's take the example of low bias so for a, for the similar squiggly higher order polynomial model we see with the same training data set that it is very tightly knit or tightly fits with this training data set so in this case it is not biased towards any sort of variation in the data or uh, as opposed to linear regression where it is very much biased towards linearly varied data so in this case we say that this quigley model has very low bias error 
but remember we talk about bias in the context of training data set now let's say let's see what one means by variance so from a intuitive and statistical point of view variance means is really a measure of the spread between data sets or rather between data points so in this case we see let's take the example of this uh, same squiggly line squiggly model where it fits really well for the training data set at hand now what about if someone gives us two disjoint testing data sets so in this case we see two data sets say a and b where testing data set a is represented by green circles and testing data set b is represented by yellow circles so in this case we see that the squiggly model obviously performs well for the training data set because it has been fitted in according to that but what about the these two testing data sets clearly as one might see that it performs really bad badly for the testing data set a but for testing data set b which is the yellow circles it performs really well so in this case we see here is where variance comes in so this sort of difference between the fits presented by this model for two different testing data sets is what one says is variance so in in the case of the former we say that the model has high variance with respect to the testing data set which is the green circles but in the case of the latter we we say that the model has low variance with respect to the testing data set however there's a problem when one talks about real life machine learning algorithms one really has to compromise between bias and variance one typically requires that these quantities have a low value but there's always a compromise so this is what one means by the bias variance trade off typically one might encounter algorithms which have if they have low bias generally one would expect that they have high variance and if they have low variance typically they have high bias so there's always this compromise that one comes up to clearly one one would essentially try to find out algorithms which have low bias and low variance which is good so from this visual chart one can see a very intuitive picture of what means what someone means when they say uh, an algorithm has low bias or low variance and so on so by variance high highly varied high variance models the in this chart one can see that the spread is much higher compared to low variance models where the spread is not as much but in the case of bias we see that low bias models are more centered around the point uh, at the cent and at the center but for high bias models they are more off centered all right so this come so we arrive at the end of our talk so these are the references that we had followed primarily we followed our instructor dr subankar mishra's lecture series where he presented in the first lecture what one really means by the uh, generaliz generalization and the need for machine learning and how it is really different from rote learning so i'd like to thank my instructor and my colleague shashwat for giving us this uh, platform to present our understanding of what generalization is and we had a really 
good time in explaining this so thank you very much